Super. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, today for joining us for this um, session with SGS to look at the return to Lambridge over the next few months as Brexit continues to um, have fluid changes to um, how we work with the uh, trading economy. So I'll hand over to our hosts, um, Patrick Walsh and Brendan Braley, who've put together this nice presentation from SGS. So, um, Patrick, if you'd like to take it away, I'll give you the, the reins as it, as it is. Great. Let me see if I can take this. Yeah. Can we see the presentation? Yeah, super. We're, we're seeing your screen now. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll let Brandon go ahead there. Lovely. Well, look, thanks very much, uh, Seamus. Thanks very much. And thank you, everybody, who have uh, you've given up your, your, a couple of a few minutes on your lunchtime. Um, hopefully, we won't delay you too long. My name is Brendan Brady, and I'm a sales and key account manager for SGS Transina here in Ireland. Um, we've been working with SGS over five years, and just in the last couple of in the last couple of years, obviously, just seeing the the opportunity of the Brexit pro that Brexit presented for us and just worked on a Brexit project with them. Um, I'm joined by Patrick Walsh, who I let you who, who I will let introduce uh, himself. Yeah, thanks, Brendan. Uh, my name is Patrick Walsh. Um, I've been with SGS for over four years now, involved in our uh, product uh, Transit Net. I'm actually based. Uh, I'm an, actually an Irish man based in Poland. I've been in Poland for the last ten years. Um, and I've been working with SGS for four years and the last couple of years spent uh, getting ready for Brexit and implementing the, the systems in uh, the Brexit markets. Lovely. Well, thanks, Patrick. Well, look, well, so the idea today, uh, folks, is just basically to, to show you, uh, or just, to, just to get a discussion going up around the land bridge. Um, we've put together some slides, uh, some statistics and some, uh, some information that might be of use to, to, to some of you, hopefully, going forwards. Um, so I'm literally, I'm, we'll, we'll try and get through them all. We shouldn't be any more than, I would hope, a, a half an hour at tops. Um, and obviously we'll take some questions. And if there's anything that we don't even, that we can't get around it today or whatever, we'll, we'll certainly come back to you through Seamus or through ourselves. But uh, for, without further ado, we'll move on. So um, just literally, basically talking about the uh, the importance of the land bridge. Um, I suppose really uh, pre-Brexit, um, Reports where about 150,000 trucks per, per annum would would trans would go across the land bridge from Ireland back into the UK. So you're talking about going from Dublin or Rosslare, um, into Hollyhead, Pembroke, and back out either into Rotterdam or, or Dover, Calais. Um, quite a significant amount, 150,000. Uh, and obviously, if people wanted to continue doing that after after the UK became a, a tour country, there was there was going to be implications and. Lo and behold, arrived direct ferries and, and other opportunities. Um, so what we're basically what, what we're basically looking at is look at the importance of the land bridge and, and what what actually makes it what makes it work what what would make it work and going back to it again. And I suppose the key thing is, or one of the one of the main things is, there's more there's a, there's more regular options. You can actually uh, there's more ferries that can get you out of Ireland and, and across the UK back into Holland or into to uh, um, France. Um, it does also uh, add to a, a faster delivery time for, for yourself or for your, your customers, particularly where you might be under pressure with specific cargo or something perishable goods. Um, it, can, it, can, it can obviously assist there. Um, it does also, from an efficiency perspective, ensure a swifter turnaround, and that might be for loads coming back or it might be in getting a, tr uh, a truck or somebody back over for, for additional work. Um, I think direct ferries 24 to 26 hours where you can probably get down to uh, Calais from Dublin in, well, anywhere between 12 and a half and 14 hours. Um, so there is, the, the, there's a significant time saving there. Um, as a, as a, obviously, as a result, better utilisation of results of, of resources, um, be, it, be it vehicles or whatever, and also personnel. Um, and there is, there's, a, there's obviously the cost uh, factor. Um, the land bridge has been traditionally been cheaper, and getting into France has, has been cheaper again than than, than, than uh, Netherlands. That's what the that's what the um, the research would suggest to us. Uh, and obviously, direct ferries at this stage are are an expensive option, uh, taking a little bit longer. So, 
the idea of, of having this uh, the opportunity to go back to the land bridge again is, makes makes perfect sense. Um, there's a huge bonus, and I don't know whether you've all twigged on this yet, but you can actually get duty free now on your way to uh, on the, across the land bridge. So uh, yeah, definitely worth uh, definitely worth taking note of that as you as you go forwards. Um, so look, so I suppose really just to give you uh, some understanding, um, this is this is so from from 150,000 trucks, which is which is over what 12 to 13,000 a month, basically um, Brexit came along and things went backwards, like direct ferries, COVID, um, I suppose warehouses being over being being overfilled, lots of stuff uh, basically um, coming. Uh, Get good up, lots of stuff getting in the way of uh, uh, getting back on transit or giving you give, making it easy for people not to uh, not to use the land bridge. So, if these, these are these are actually the statistics. And January, as I'm sure you all felt within your own industry, was there was literally very little happened. There was a uh, just between from Ireland back into the U back into the EU or coming out of the EU, there was less than four thousand um, less than four thousand trucks. So that was a that was a obviously that was January as good as a write off I suppose for for a lot of people. Um, February seeing things improving, uh, and March and, and April have seen further improvements. I think the key thing to take from it is that it, uh, when we would have been talking to people pre Brexit about what plans and arrangements they would have had, a lot of people were were talking about potentially direct ferries for the first couple of months. Um, and then literally looking back at the land bridge, letting things settle down. And I think that that's proven to be the, the case uh, where you can see March, April, over like almost 8,000 uh, trucks be between inbound and outbound of Ireland. One, one point to note there for you that is significant is there's a lot more trucks coming, uh, there's a lot more vehicles come inbound on transit than actually go outbound. I should actually also say, let you know but this doesn't include the UK transits um, and UK transits are also doing pe where people want to move their import duties away from the ports. So it might be that you're coming from a, an authorised consigner location uh, in the UK or, or finishing your transit in an authorised consigner location in Ireland. That possibility is there from, from transit. So you might be exporting uh, or importing and just using the transit facility or the transit procedure to just move the, uh, the the import duties away from the port so and um, that's that's basically what's happened um just to give you an understanding the the, the top the main destinations and this is a, this does stick out uh, i think significantly every traditionally we would have we would have expected people to be using uh, dublin into dover and on into calais and france should be uh, one of the uh, should probably be leading the way but it's not um, you can see in January um, outbound destinations from Ireland there was literally 36 vehicles that went under transit uh, from Ireland into France that's phenomenal um, we could, I was astounded at that number when it came through Netherlands is obviously uh, an easier option and we, we we'll get on to that a little bit more in the presentation there are, there are good there are, there are good reasons for it but uh, things have changed over the last uh, couple of months as well so but uh, you can see France is making in a bit of a recovery from the 36th in January where we were afraid of uh, long lines of traffic and whatever uh, in Dover and uh, and delays at Calais up to April where there's over just 356 trucks went um, went out of Ireland and finished in France and Netherlands as I say is still far, is still miles ahead um, and that's the top five. There's lots of other there's the smaller numbers below that when you go back when you think back of the uh, the overall number. Um, but they're, they're, that's literally the top five outbound destinations from Ireland um, into back into the EU. And again, as I said, you'd have like that, that too. You'd have a, a similar number, yeah, like that's about fifty percent uh, again is going back into is going into the UK. Who's the most uh, photos? So, okay. So I'll, I'll just go. So literally, just to give you a look at outbound, then as well. If we if I uh, flick on to the next slide, Patrick. Sorry. Yeah, they are right on the inbound. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Have we gone over from the? Have we gone over. Yeah, Grand Good Man. Okay. So look at same same scenario. Um, literally, Netherlands is leading the way. Very, very like France. Very uh, very, down to fifth. 
um, very low. But again, as you can see, nothing happening in January. 137, uh, 137 troops been coming from France under transit into Ireland to over almost 400 in April. And you can see where that number has just been steadily rising every month, I think, as people begin to dip their toe in the water. And we probably become a little bit more comfortable and familiar with the uh, with the customs requirements. Um, so that's that's literally that's your, that's the transit numbers um, for the next like for for the first four months of uh, of the year. That's what's basically been happening. That's registered in the EU. Um, there'd be we, we we would some of them some of them transit would be employees of SGS, but there's other people coming in from Europe and going out of Ireland under transit as well, and they're all counted in there just to give you a, an understanding of, of what's actually happening out there. Okay. So we flip oh. that on, Patrick, yeah. And we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with, the, obviously the slides and the, the numbers will be left available for you, but Patrick is going to give you some updates on what's happening in the, uh, um, on the ground and, and, and some of the requirements that were, that were, that were uh, we were asked to, 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 to take by customs as we uh, uh, post Brexit, so and just give you a, an update on some of them. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Brendan. Yeah, I suppose uh, when we spoke about the land bridge and we were everybody was getting prepared for the land bridge before um, before Brexit, one of the things that came up was this famous uh, Kent access permit. Uh, it was nicknamed the passport to Kent in the in the UK media, and essentially it was a it was a registration in an online system that was needed to be done to allow a driver to uh, drive in the Kent area. Uh, the idea was that um, it was it would it was designed to avoid congestion in the Kent area. So this was another kind of layer on top of the other requirements, so the other transit requirements to get across the, the UK land bridge, and this is, was seen as kind of you know another another restrictive uh, measure and put in place by the UK government to. Uh, uh, to control, you know, control the drivers, control the flow of traffic into the Kent area. Uh, good news for us and to, for everybody who uses the land bridge was that as of uh, the 20th of April of this year, the requirements for drivers to have a valid Kent access permit is no longer needed. So the UK government actually decided to remove this requirement uh, due to a number of reasons. Um, the long queues of lorries on roads to and from key UK channel ports have, ne have not materialised. So, you know, in the build up to Brexit, and even at the start of the Brexit, there was a lot of talk about, uh, you know, long queues of tra uh, traffic uh, stuck at Dover port, um, trying to access the Eurotunnel, etc. This actually never happened. Uh, there is very little congestion in the, in the Dover area. Um, the UK government credits the Kent access permit for that as well. Um, saying that hauliers have been arriving at the border prepared, so anybody arriving at the border has had their custom declarations prepared. Um, from the start of the year, they had 80% compliance, um, and the latest statistics before they shut the requirements showed up to 86% uh, compliance. So it it, what was really relevant was that there was very few turnbacks, so trucks that were arriving were never, to, were, very few of them were actually turned back. Um, Again, the removal of this is a very positive sign for the land bridge. Uh, it's positive in the sense that this idea of the long queues of trucks uh, never happened, never materialized. It's not a factor. It doesn't exist as we speak today. Uh, so it's not something that people should be uh, worried about uh, when they're when they're thinking about using uh, when they thinking about using the land bridge. I just wanted to share with you also a bit of our experience uh, with uh, using the land bridge. Uh, SGS is obviously a, a, a multinational company and we have a number of affiliates uh, using our transit service and it's, about, it's up to about 20 at this stage. And they include, of course, Ireland, the UK, Poland, France, the Netherlands and Turkey. Um, so these affiliates, they all have clients uh, whether the clients are transporters, forwarders, logistic operators, etc., uh, they're all you know Polish companies, French companies, Dutch companies, and Turkish companies. Most of these companies have been using the land bridge since day one. One thing that came back uh, when we did a bit of market research and you know contacted these companies about their use of the land bridge, 
uh, was they noted, noted that it was extremely difficult to convince the Irish customers, their Irish customers, to use the land bridge. So this kind of, this really was very interesting to hear that it was obviously the exporters dictating which way the transporters would travel. So if they, if they would use the land bridge or if they would use the, uh, if they would use the direct route. The, um, the foreign clients, uh, specifically one Polish company we spoke to, uh, noted that it really ch had trouble to convince the Irish exporter to, to, to let them use the land bridge to get the goods across. Eventually they agreed and they've been using it ever since uh, without any major, any major issues. One thing of note, um, I suppose, is the cost of transit. Um, because there's this idea that um, if you're transporting high value goods, of course, the cost of transit would be a little bit higher because of the, the value of the guarantee. And um, so there's an assumption that the cost of, if the cost of the, and the value of the goods is high, uh, transit will not be used and the truck will take the direct route uh, to avoid the transit fee. In our experience, this hasn't been actually 100% the, the case. Well, we've had a lot of high value movements uh, moving across the land bridge. Um, when we would have thought ourselves that they would have they would have used the, the direct routes, uh, but in this case the transporter decided to they wanted to use the land bridge and they paid the fee uh, for the transit document. So across the board, the land bridge is used, you know, for to get goods quickly across the uh, across into Europe, uh, but it's not necessarily the cost of transit is determining whether they use the land bridge or not. One of the main points. That we got back from the, the foreign transporters was the direct ferry was just too expensive. Uh, when they compared the prices of the direct ferry with using the uh, short straits between Dover and Calais and uh, over into Ireland, uh, the direct ferry just worked out too expensive. No major issues reported um, from these transporters. The automatic discharge of the transit, the T2 in Ireland, is a big plus. So, this idea that the PBN discharge to the, the, the T2 uh, in Ireland is a big is a major bonus for the transporters. They don't have to go to a customs office, etc. Uh, but this is very positive uh, from, a, from, a, from an Irish point of view and, on, and from a foreign transporter point of view. Uh, for these foreign transporters, it was important for them to have all the services in, in one place. So when we're talking about using the land bridge, we're, you know, we're not only talking about transit, we talk about transit, we talk about GVMS, we talk about ENS, we talk about PBN. Uh, so it was important for them to kind of have access uh, to one service who could offer all of these uh, all of all of these elements. Um, you can imagine for a foreign transporter, it might be difficult to source an Irish ENS declaration, for example. Uh, even a GVMS entry, because you have to have a GBORI number, would not be easy for a Turkish uh, Turkish transporter to organise. So the idea of having this under one kind of point of contact uh, appealed uh, to, to the transporters which were using the land bridge. If I just take it on, just based on the statistics that Brendan um, that Brendan produced and that are, that are available, um, and to everybody's surprise, um, as traditionally the land bridge is associated with you know across into France into Calais, uh, the land bridge to the Netherlands has proved a very popular route uh, as per the statistics. It's proved a popular route despite the fact that the transit time is a little longer. Uh, we have it at about eighteen hours. It can cost slightly more as well. Um, so that's obviously, an, obviously another, sort of another surprise when we compare it to the land bridge journey to France. Just in general about the land bridge to the Netherlands, uh, if we're going from Ireland into the Netherlands, the ENS, these are probably some of the reasons what makes the Netherlands an attractive, uh, an attractive destination via the land bridge. The ENS declaration, which is needed, is provided by the ferry operator based on information provided at booking level. So when you book a ferry from, you know, from the UK to the, uh, to the Netherlands, as many of you probably know, you have to provide information to, which allows the, comp the ferry company to complete ENS on your behalf. Uh, so this is obviously very convenient. And the port-based message, uh, which is a message need for, to notify the port of Rotterdam of the arrival of any transit declarations or any, you know, any declarations, is also handled by the ferry company. So this removes another layer uh, of complexity for the, for the transporters. One of the major pluses of the Netherlands, uh, and this actually you can, you can compare it to France as well, is the fact that the transits are automatically discharged on arrival uh, to Rotterdam. And this is 
it is we have confer confirmed by ferry companies the st uh, Stanoline, P&O, and DFTS. So at the time of the booking the ferry, you have to give the, the T2 MRN number, and Stanoline, P&O, and DFTS have confirmed that they will discharge the transit automatically uh, on arrival in Rotterdam. This is obviously a huge uh, simplification, uh, similar to the Irish PBN system, um, that they discharge the transit and it avoids the need for the driver or anybody to go to the customs to discharge the transit. Another kind of uh, to note about the Netherlands when we compare it to France, cheds, uh, which are needed for SPS goods, uh, so products, products of animal origin, uh, in traces NT are not needed, and there's no additional checks for SPS goods. Um, so these are kind of the, the specifics of the land bridge uh, to the Netherlands. If we talk about land bridge from the Netherlands, um, obviously the statistics shows by Brennan that the route is extremely popular coming back into, uh, um, into Ireland via the UK. I suppose for Irish companies, one of the biggest issues would be to find a transit provider. Uh, so an Irish company looking for a transit provider in, in the Netherlands might be difficult. If you're coming back from the Netherlands through to the, through the UK, you're going to need obviously a T2 uh, with guarantee. You're going to have to be able to do a port-based message. So this is the notification in the port system. GVMS again is mandatory for entry into the UK. ENS is another declaration which is needed in Ireland, which is mandatory. And PBN is obviously mandatory as well, which needs to include the transit MRN and the ENS MRN to allow the, to allow the truck to board the ferry in Holyhead. Obviously, the positives are that the T2 is discharged automatically based on PBN. And like a transit declaration to the Netherlands, uh, for a transit declaration from Europe to the UK into Ireland, no cheds are required. So there's no cheds uh, needed in Traces NT uh, for SBS goods for products, uh, product of animal origin. Just to give you an idea of what SGS can do um, to and from the Netherlands, Mm, we obviously have uh, our own transit service called TransitNet, which we have we, which we have introduced before, uh, which gives the ability for people to uh, submit T2 uh, transit declarations with SGS guarantee um, from a number of countries, including from Ireland uh, and from the Netherlands. TransitNet is also connected to GVMS, uh, so you can generate your GVMS via TransitNet, uh, and it's also connected to the ENS. Uh, the ICS Ireland service, which can generate the ENS message, uh, ENS declaration into the Irish customs. We obviously have our own SGS affiliate in the Netherlands as well, which is always available in case of any problems with the Dutch customs. Um, and one, one obviously unique feature is that the return route from, the net, from Rotterdam from the, from the Netherlands is also possible from all the major ferry terminals. So if you're coming back to the land bridge via Stena Line, P&O and DFTS, uh, Transitnet can open transit declarations under the simplified procedure um, from, from these locations. And we have a number of clients who use that route uh, from, the Rotter from Rotterdam and use Stenaline and P&O ferries specifically into the UK and onto, uh, and onto Ireland. T2 from via Transitnet also includes, uh, can include, uh, port-based notification, which we can do. Uh, the GVMS, as we have mentioned, and the ENS to Ireland, which is included in the prices um, and is needed for the, to create that famous uh, PBN. If we go to France, um, which is obviously the, statistic, the statistics are quite startling in, in terms of, you know, the traditional land bridge um, model suggested that France was the route of choice due to the, you know, due to the quickness and the time efficiency. And the statistics are proving, of course, that there was hesitation to use the land bridge, particularly France. It is getting better. The statistics are going up a little bit, but it's still not at the level of, you know, as we, if, we can, if we can compare it to the Netherlands. The direct routes uh, really took over in the first few months um, to an extent that many of them were sold out. Um, many of this, as I've spoken before, was chosen, was, was based on the choice of the exporter. So the exporter dictated uh, that the transporter should use the direct route because they were worried about time um, and the goods getting to the getting to the location in time. Um, GVMS again is mandatory uh, if you're using the land bridge going into France. 
one maybe how can we call it maybe some, an, 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 an obstacle we can say for an Irish transporter or an Irish company using the land bridge into France was the fact that an ENS declaration was the obligation of the transporter. So unlike uh, ferry companies into the Netherlands or even into Belgium, um, the ferry companies operating, most of the ferry companies operating the short straits between Dover and Calais would not provide the ENS declaration. That's beginning to change in the fact that DFDS now offer um, ENS declarations for people using DFDF ferries uh, from Dover into France. Um, and so the idea of a, uh, an Irish transporter trying to source ENS declarations has gotten a little bit easier. And this is something also we offer uh, via Transanet as well. The French smart border system, which was much spoke about uh, as well at the start of the year, is actually not mandatory. So there's a bit of confusion there. Um, many people, they think they have to register. It's not a mandatory system. It's purely advised from a point of view that if you have multiple transit declarations uh, to create the, what they call an envelope, uh, which will group the, the T2s under one kind of barcode. Uh, from an Irish point of view, this is not needed because really you will only have one transit declaration traveling from Ireland uh, through, through Great Britain into the UK. Uh, basically, the French bar smart border system works on a pairing system. Uh, so through cameras and technology, it pairs the registration plates of the truck uh, with the necessary customs declarations and assigns the, uh, the, the type of control or the type of light the truck will get on entry to France. Uh, generally, T2 transit declarations from Ireland are green, are green lighted. Uh, so, I mean, they're not taken for control. Um, the French customs would not really have much interest in uh, T2 transit declarations from Ireland, purely because the goods are European. Um, they're much more focused on UK goods, which are which are coming into uh, coming into the European market. One of the biggest obstacles uh, for many, um, and maybe this is one of the reasons why France has, has proven uh, unpopular in terms of using the land bridge, is because the transits are not discharged automatically on, on arrival to France. So they actually have to be closed by an agent or a broker. So for example, if a driver arrives in France, the driver cannot actually even go to a customs office. Uh, representation to close at a customs office needs to be done by an agent or a broker. Um, so this is quite restrictive uh, in the sense that the driver cannot go to customs in France and that they need an agent or broker. And this could explain some of the reasons uh, why the land bridge hasn't proved popular um, to France. There's always the possibility, of course, to continue the transit to another country. And so let's say, for example, in Germany or in Poland, uh, the driver is allowed to attend the customs office in Germany and Poland. Um, and this would also be a possibility to close the T2 uh, in one of these countries at directly at the customs office. Uh, this is obviously, um, it's preferable by a lot of people using the land bridge to close the transit as quickly as possible. And this is why people prefer to close it in France and, uh, and we as SGS have, been, have found a solution to do that. Um, but it can explain why a lot of, uh, a lot of people are not using uh, the, French, uh, the French entry via the land bridge. One of the other one of the other issues, and when we compare it to the, the Netherlands, is that uh, SPS goods. So when we say SPS goods, we refer to products of animal origin, require a, a CHED declaration in, tra in traces NT. Now a CHED declaration has to be made for any animal products crossing uh, Great Britain and into France. Any Irish, any European company can do this, um, as long as you have a URI number, and can do it in the, in the system. But it's just a kind of an extra layer of uh, paperwork that people would have to take care of if they wanted to use France uh, as, a, as a, an entry point uh, an entry point to the to the EU. So if I just keep going. Uh, from France, coming back, we saw the statistics from Brendan again. Mm, they weren't so impressive. Um, again, for an Irish company coming back, even if they had their own transit guarantee, uh, it's difficult to find a transit provider just some specifics about using the language from France. This, again, like I mentioned, the smart, the French smart border system uh, is optional. Uh, so again, it's, it doesn't have to be used. So this is one thing we can remove from the equation along with the Kent Access Pass, uh, which coming from Ireland. The GVMS service into, into GB is mandatory. The ENS in Ireland, again, is mandatory. The PBN is mandatory. 
the big plus of coming into Ireland is the T2s are discharged automatically based on the PBN. And there's no shed required uh, for SPS goods. Just in terms of uh, the land bridge to France with SGS, uh, something which we operate for, uh, have operated since the start of January. We of course provide the T2s and the guarantees, the GVMS service into Great Britain, ENS for France and is included in the fee. And we call it kind of an all in one click. Uh, we do have support in place on entry to France if necessary through SGS France and our partners uh, located in Calais. And what we have managed to do uh, as SGS is we have a partnership with uh, the Calais truck stop, which is just located just outside uh, Calais. Um, and they are an authorized consignee. Uh, and on our behalf, they close uh, transit declarations which have been created uh, in Ireland. So if a truck is coming into France and they have that problem about where they're going to close the T2 transit declaration, T2 transit declaration can be closed at the Calais truck stop who are acting as an authorized consignee. Um, so many Irish companies who use uh, SGS uh, would, and who use the French route as their route of uh, as their route of choice, would use the Calais truck stop to close their transit declaration because they really want to get that transit declaration um, closed as quickly as possible. Uh, from France, coming back, we have the same partnership with the Calais truck stop in terms of that transit declarations can be started from that location. Um, and again, no need to go to the customs office. These transit declarations are opened under the simplified procedure. So it would just be a case that the driver would have to go to the Calais truck stop to open the transit declaration. And the staff at the Calais truck stop would print the T2 transit declaration for the driver um, and give, the, give this to the driver um, to continue his journey. Uh, the T2 transit declaration, the PDF copy is actually needed in the UK, even though the NCTS is a paper, supposed to be a paperless service. The UK have said that the driver should have a copy of the T2 transit declaration on them. Uh, so it's handy for the driver to be able to get it from, the, from a location and to travel with it through the UK. Uh, again, with SGS, we, cut, we provide the GVMS service via Transitnet and the ENS uh, in Ireland is also provided. And the T2, again, is discharged automatically um, via the PBN. So in terms of um, the land bridge and what is next, um, we continue as we are today. Um, a lot of the extra controls that the UK had planned to put in place uh, have been pushed back uh, until, the, until towards the end of the year. One of the major controls which they have pushed back is the controls for product of animal origin goods entering the UK. So this has been pushed back until October uh, 2021. So this means that Irish trucks using the land bridge can still cross uh, via the land bridge uh, without any checks on entry uh, at Great Britain and any, without any extra needs um, to do any extra paperwork or to do any extra, extra entries in, in any other uh, Great British systems. There's rumours that it might be pushed back even further. Um, there's problems with uh, resources in the UK in terms of these border, what they call BCPs, border control points. Um, people are not sure that uh, the resources and the facilities will be in place to, um, to control um, trucks with product development animal origin goods coming into the UK. So there's big, there's big rumors, even though we're only in May and it's supposed to come in October, there's already rumors starting that it's going to be pushed back even further. If or when this happens, uh, it will mean trucks with SPS or PO, POAO goods will additionally need health certificates and IPAFs entry. IPAFs is the UK's equivalent of Traces NT. So it's the UK equivalent of basically the CHED. Uh, so basically what they're saying at the moment is a truck with these kind of goods will also need a health certificate and will also need an IPAF entry. So this is kind of probably the same situation as if you're moving goods from Ireland into the UK. Uh, but now they're saying that these, this would be needed um, for trucks using, using the land bridge, even though the destination is EU. Uh, currently, the UK government's stance is that these trucks are going to need health certificates and IPAF entry, uh, as crazy, as crazy as it sounds. In general, as well as this additional uh, need of health certificates and IPAFs, um, there'll probably be when this or if this is eventually introduced, there'll probably be an identity check done at Hollyhead. Physical controls are extremely unlikely for 
Irish trucks transiting the land bridge purely because the resources involved to, to control physically control so many trucks is not going to be is not going to be easy. So probably it would be simply an identity check, a documentary check, and a seal check at Hollyhead just to make sure um, just to make sure the truck is, is is what it says it is. There is a scope as well for Irish companies who rely on the, the land bridge, and this is something that has been kind of discussed in the in you know in the media, etc. Um, for a generally veterinary a general veterinary approval for processing plants. So if you have a kind of meat processing plant, uh, it's happened in Europe um, in different countries that the plant is granted a general approval uh, based on their, the plant meeting certain reg, you know certain um, certain requirements. Uh, so this would mean that the plant transporting goods like this via the land bridge wouldn't need a veterinary control for each individual shipment. Uh, and could control this on a general basis for goods leaving their uh, leaving their premises. This obviously would be a huge uh, benefit um, to companies who could who could have something like this. There's question marks over the ENS and the EXS requirements. So the ENS, the entry summary entry summary declaration into the UK, and the EXS, which is the exit summary declaration from the UK. Originally, um, the EXS declaration requirements were supposed to come in at the start of the year. We had uh, really heavily questioned this requirement for an, a land bridge truck, an Irish truck with EU goods, why they would need an exit summary declaration uh, from the UK with the, with the UK government. We questioned it uh, with the policy colleagues there. Eventually, it was pushed back uh, to April 2021, and it's been pushed back again uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, there's no logic uh, for an Irish truck or an EU, EU goods to need an EXS declaration. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on um, in terms of if it will be required. And the same situation with an entry summary declaration, whether a truck is in transit needs an entry summary declaration is a, is a big question into, into Great Britain. Usually an entry summary declaration would only be needed for goods uh, coming into Great Britain and staying, uh, staying in Great Britain. So through our you know, various conversations and you know, different kind of researches, et cetera, um, the delays are indicating that this may never actually become a reality. So the idea that they're pushing back um, the introduction of these extra, extra requirements uh, and different rumors people are hearing indicates that there are policy discussions going on behind the scenes. Um, and we're hoping, uh, like a lot of Irish companies are hoping, uh, specifically around the product of animal origin goods, and that these uh, that there'll be some agreement in place between the EU and the UK that will mean that these will be completely uh, completely removed from the equation. Whether that happens, time will tell. Um, but I know as well from uh, from a, we've heard recently uh, that GVMS was pushed back. Uh, that was made official that it was pushed back to the start of next year for import and export into into the UK. Uh, there's already rumours that that's going to be pushed back again because the systems are just uh, are just not working correctly. Um, so I suppose just in, in a general context, uh, from an SGS point of view, uh, the land bridge works. Um, it's used. Uh, it's not. It's used not only by Irish transporters. It's used by foreign transporters as well. The Netherlands is obviously leading the way in terms of statistics um, and the numbers of movements going through it, but. A lot of that can be traced back to the fact that there's huge hesitation and a lot of um, yeah a lot of hesitation about using the French route due to due to normal uh, due to you know the requirements the extra requirements into France specifically around the CHED requirements and the closing the transit requirements the CHED requirement is an extra kind of formality it's nothing to be uh, it's nothing to be afraid of as long as it's completed correctly the truck will generally be green lighted. Um, and closing the transit obviously is one of the big is the biggest issues, um, which we as SGS have looked to address and, and provide that service for Irish companies who, who wish to continue to use uh, the land bridge into into Calais, which after all is the quickest route into Calais, uh, into France, into the EU, um, and which is both the most cost effective route as well. So that's pretty much us for today. Um, I hope that this was of some uh, use to you, but uh, we're very happy or willing to take any questions if you have them. Um, so we can open up the floor to questions.
Yeah, folks, that was some uh, very useful insight and statistics into the reality of movements over the first third of the year. So thanks very much for that, for that information. Um, if anybody doesn't feel like audibly voicing a question, we do have a chat box as well. So please feel free to send a message via that method if you prefer. This first question there, looking for a bit of a further explanation about EXS. Yeah, EXS in the UK, Seamus, yeah? I believe so. Yeah, yeah so basically uh, from, I think it was the middle of last year, the middle of 2020 before Brexit, uh, it became clear from the UK government that they're, uh, they're going to demand an EXS declaration for Irish trucks uh, transiting the land bridge. So basically, um, when an Irish truck would enter the UK to leave the UK, they would need an EXS declaration. So it's an exit summary declaration. Uh, an exit summary declaration is, is actually from Ireland it's provided as part of the transit declaration. Um, so never, uh, never an Irish company has to worry about doing an e EXS from Ireland. Um, but according to the UK government, they wanted an EXS declaration for trucks transiting the UK. Uh, this, this was actually due to go in on the 1st of January, but was pushed back to April 2021. Uh, and it's been pushed back again, I think, to September um, of this year. Logically, it makes absolutely no sense why uh, the UK export system would want a view on EU goods which are traveling through the UK. Uh, we've raised that with the, with the UK authorities to say it, from a policy point of view, it makes absolutely no sense. Um, so in terms of whether it actually will become a, a reality, we are extremely doubtful. Um, at the same time, we're preparing ourselves uh, to be ready for that in the event that it, just, it does become a possibility or a necessity. Uh, we as SGS have that, you know, have that backup plan in place to be able to provide that. But we're quite hopeful that it won't become a, it won't become a requirement. Okay. Okay. Um, can a Northern Ireland registered company make a transit declaration to NCTS in the Republic of Ireland, or they, do they need to do it in TSS system only? Okay. Uh, so. TSS uh, doesn't do transit uh, for the land bridge, as I understand. Um, so a Northern Irish company wishing to um, wishing to do a transit declaration via the land bridge into the EU uh, would need to find another option. Um, for example, we have a lot of Northern Irish companies who use uh, who use TransitNet. They open transit declarations from Belfast uh, through the UK, uh, through Great Britain, and into the into the EU. Um, so there are two options. Obviously, find a company to do it on your behalf. So let's say, for example, uh, ourselves, for example, or there's, uh, you know, the, obviously the idea to look at trying doing it yourself uh, by getting software in place and getting your own transit guarantee. Um, but in terms of operations from Northern Ireland, uh, they are done via SGS every day. Uh, we have some clients regularly who use this route, uh, specifically from Belfast into Great Britain. Uh, and back into back into the EU. Uh, and on the flip side, we have this, uh, clients who use the land bridge to come back in from France into Great Britain and straight into and in straight into uh, and straight into Northern Ireland. Super. Okay. Anybody? Anything else there? Are, are we pushing? Pe are we robbing people's lunch now? Okay. I guess. I guess no questions is a sign of a very comprehensive and well-delivered presentation. So, well done, folks. We hope so. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much, James, and thanks very much, everybody, for 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 listening to us. And obviously, if we're, we'd be a we're, we, if, if anyone does have any further questions, we'd, we'd always we'd make ourselves available, no problem whatsoever. Sound. And it's okay to make the slides available to members afterwards? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Yeah. Super. Great. Okay.
Well, that's fine. Look, I'll, I'll get the recording available later on as well. So I'll ping both the recording of the webinar and the slides available to members. And if they don't have any questions, if they have the questions, I can then, of course, fund them back to you folks as well. Okay. Super. Okay. okay. Well, thanks, 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 thanks. Thank you. Bye. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah. Let's see.